day um, of the ASP summer tutorial. Um, today, uh, the topic is um, SC interactions, and I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker. Um, professor Chui Cheng is a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington. Um, her research focuses on uh, ASCII interactions and precipitation in the tropics and uh, coastal environment using airborne and satellite observations and coupled atmosphere wave ocean models. Um, she has been the lead scientist for many field campaigns and also served on advisory boards, uh, such as the as a, the vice chair of the National Academies Board on Atmospheric Science and Climate. It's a pleasure to have you here, Shuri. Please go ahead. Thanks, Judith. Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, if we're in this sort of a three time zones so far, but still all in the morning. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, just a second. So can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Yes. All right. So I'm going to turn the camera off, just making sure the bandwidth is OK. OK, so uh, you know, after so many two days now, you'll continue to hear a bit more on um, MGO. So this particular lecture, I'm going to focus on a multi-scale air-sea interaction process from convective system known as the thunderstorms, right, to um, MGO and ENSO. So in terms of uh, the time spatial scale, we tend to think we know weather and we know the climate, which is ENSO side, it's a longer time scale. Then MGO is somewhere in between. So, um, I want to acknowledge this particular uh, work that uh, I will be showing you quite a bit of results coming from uh, multi uh, students, postdocs, and uh, contributions to my group. Yaklin uh, Gorkin is the one that contributed quite a bit of the material in here. Brandon Kearns, also Ida Saravan, all PhD students in my group. Um, I will start with this image here showing a instantaneous satellite image with typhoons or tropical cyclones, you can easily identify that cyclonic circulation, northern hemisphere, anti-cyclonic southern hemisphere. So the question is, can you identify MGO on a weather map, right? So MGO is a phenomena that do show up on everyday maps, right? So how do you identify that? What is MGO? As it turned out, this big systems here, that background is the uh, uh, water vapor, integrated, vertically integrated water vapor, and the precipitating part is the green gray area. So MGO is this not a very well defined large scale convective system that can contains lots of different pieces of convection with some central piece that like strong surface wind, and then sometimes spin off tropical cyclone as it forms in the ocean, propagates through maritime continent and move over to um, the Western Pacific. Along the way, it's interacting with lots of different phenomena as we all know. And also, as you heard, so if I start, can you have that? have time to advance in the screen here. Um, this is a map from uh, uh, the work from the uh, people I've shown, you, you have seen this quite a bit about how to look at global impact of this multi-scale phenomena. MGO is the phenomena sitting here, usually form over the Indian Ocean and propagates toward um, West Pacific and Central Pacific and interacting with this phenomena downstream like the ITCZ and so, and so on. So 
last few days, you also have heard a lot of the uh, connection to the uh, mid, mid latitude uh, wave trend and so on and so on. However, the complicated piece of MGO is none of the MGO individually are like your composite exactly. So MGO can propagate toward the south. That center of the heating is actually sitting in the southern hemisphere. That has a very different implication than the heating source is sitting on the equator. On the other hand, MGO can also propagate northward. So this is where I want you to check out all your pre uh, notion about you know exactly what MGO is like because MGO individually is quite diverse. If we are looking at the downstream influence like the tropical cyclones, heat wave and so on, the heat sources sitting in Northern hemisphere is very different than the one sitting in the Southern hemisphere. And traditionally, this has not been identified. We don't have a tool to identify this diversity uh, of MGO. So again, what is MGO? How diverse is it? How can we actually identify individual uh, MGO events on the weather maps? And what is the air sea interaction and the role in the coupling class scales? So how does individual convective uh, systems interacting with the MGO as a large scale dynamic system and how the MGO could be upscaling to interacting with, the, and so that's the subject in the next 20, 25 minutes. So I will be using quite a bit of a, uh, data as uh, Judith said, I'm a fan of the uh, field campaigns. I use a lot of observation to describe uh, the phenomena uh, we observe, understand the physical process in addition, we also use the coupled atmosphere ocean models to uh, understand the physical process. So this is usually you would see in this half molar diagram uh, in Zhang's paper 2005 that you're looking at a precipitation. This time goes up and then this is a global uh, scale here. And then you basically looking at eastward propagating this enhanced precipitation associated with 850 millibar winds, westerly winds, right? So that just the half Miller diagram tell you the zonal property of the MGO. And then at the same time, we decided we need to describe MGO um, in a little simplistic way. So we're making composite. So over many years, we accumulate the data we're making composite, which means we treat MGO as anomaly. Um, so this is a composite where we start to identify certain property is we're propagating um, convection that is positive anomaly, negative anomaly. Then we do EOF analysis and, and so on. So we end up with uh, the uh, RMM index, which is all very familiar to many of you. These are very, very useful and uh, convenient tool to use, right? So basically we're looking at phase one, two cross maritime continent. This is Indian Ocean going all the way around and then get to phase eight, right? So that's composite. Individually, does MGO look like it's a composite? And at the same time, does this thing representing uh, not only zonal, meridional variability, right? Obviously this measure doesn't actually do that. So with that in mind, we decide to um, come up with another way to track MGO that as a physical quantity using precipitation maps. So this two paper uh, by Kern Chen, 2016 and 20, that we use uh, trim data over 20 years to uh, decide to track the large scale precipitation. The way it works is that we'll filter the data and then do a three day accumulation. So we're making sure that what we're tracking is a large scale precipitation object. Um, then we track them in time. 
this tracking method has described in there. I wouldn't go through too much details here, but you do need a threshold uh, in terms of a millimeter per day and how big spatially and so on and so on. So we want to track this at least greater than seven days. So that means we want these truly large scale beyond synoptic uh, scale precipitation patterns. Then lastly, the MGO have another uh, constraint that has to be greater than 10 days. We want to be sure that it's into the sub-seasonal scale, at least the 10 days. And we also um, constrain that it needs to be propagated eastward. So with that in mind, this is a actual precipitation map, top left corner. And then we accumulate in precipitation and making the uh, tracking part. So this black curve is the one that I talk about large scale precipitation object. And that tracks the whole system eastward, right? So this tracking method leave us with an entity that is called MGOLPT systems. So the lower diagram shows you the uh, something tracked in time. So this color representing time. So now you can see the MGO has certain places to start in the ocean and uh, wobbling around the north and south and so on and so on. Make this big footprint of a phenomenon that we usually don't think about them, uh, but we're thinking them phase one, phase two. But in fact, many MGOs doesn't quite get to the entire phase of things. So the advantage of this is that now we're not only having MGO propagate eastward, we also can look at the meridional structures. This happened to be extremely important for downstream influence of how MGO influence global patterns. So I include this event compared to this particular event was observing the, uh, during the Dynamo field campaign. Then you can track many of them and you can see a lot of a complicated wobbling around and that this particular event propagate quite farther into the south and the southern hemisphere. So the implication or its dynamic uh, properties of this MGO versus that is quite different. So to summarize all them up on this map, um, the top panel shows you the uh, tracks of each track the system over 20 years. Um, then the starting point is this blue dot and the red is ending point that these systems at least be seven days tracked. We call it LPTs. Uh, the lower panel just show you the uh, density of these tracks and tell you where they reside it's more so than the other stuff. So then you can see these systems can be tracked across um, Pacific. So if I add a constraint to 10 days and beyond it has to be propagating eastward, and now we're left with MGO LPT. That's over 200 events. Now you can see the diversity of MGO. They tend to form in the equatorial region, these blue dots, but they propagate not only along the equator, they end up north. And a lot of this Northern system is in the summer and the boreal summer. And also winter season, January, February tend to be farther south, right? So there's quite a bit of seasonality, individuality and so on. With this system, we can actually identify MGO individually. So now I want to leave you with an important thought about MGO. So given that we can track MGO individually, we can look at the percentage of MGO contribute the total precipitation in the annual precipitation over the globe, entire globe. So if you're looking into this region in the Indian Ocean and the West Pacific, so in this paper we described, MGO itself contributed close to about half of annual precipitation. Think about that. MGO has been viewed as an anomaly, but in fact, MGO is the base state here, contribute to half of that. So we have a problem in terms of looking at MGO as an anomaly. Um, so many of the uh, 
series and things build on that as an anomaly, but not as a real event. So another diversity of the MGO is MGO have the property that form over Indian Ocean and some cross maritime continent, some cannot, right? So non-propagating ones. And apparently this was uh, referred to as a barrier effects of MGO. Uh, some form in the, over the West Pacific and continue propagate uh, into Central Pacific. So it's a quite a diverse. And we've done a lot of work to try to understand this barrier, barrier effect. So, so far, um, I don't think I have time right now to go through all the detail except to say that uh, this barrier layer effect is still a mystery that continue to uh, really drive a lot of our research on that. So now getting into the couple of the system. So if you look at that, the MGO properties, which is observed, so the ones formed in the West Pacific, the, the bars here is observed, the first one is the trend. It's the blue bar is how many events over this 20 years. And the green and the brown are the ones form over Indian Ocean. Then the brown ones is the one that cannot propagate cross maritime continent. And then the green one is does cross, cross right? So if you look at all the global models here, you don't need to pay attention to individuals. You can see model overall have difficulty to actually have MGO formed over the Indian Ocean, right? So really very little green bars and so on and that. But um, the model's way overdone over West Pacific. But if you look at these pointers of a several coupled model, in general, coupled atmosphere model does much better in general to produce MGO with one particular property that coupled model does is that coupled model tend to produce better speed and uh, zonal, um, the latitude, uh, the, the longitude range. So if we uh, plot a dot, this is a trim. So basically you can see this uh, propagation speed in the zonal direction. And this is the range of a, a zonal, uh, in terms of degree of a lat, uh, longitude, sorry. And then, then you can see here, trim set here, and this is ECMWF reforecast. So in general, these are kind of a good corner. And if you see this line, majority of a coupled model actually does much better than majority of uncoupled model. So uncoupled model is way too slow, right? So now I'm going to try to get you a few things about physical process. What are the physical process the ocean now contributing to better representation of the MGO. So in the past, you probably heard about the ocean have this um, slow time scale. If you are looking at a phenomena that in a few days time scale, you can forget it. You don't need the ocean. And then if you go on to longer time scale, then ocean start to play a role. I want you to drop that concept. Ocean contribute right away and interacting with the uh, MGO in a much shorter time scale. And in fact, the ocean contributes to the detailed structures as well as the eastward propagation in this very uh, closely coupled system. So that's just what I said. Okay, how do we know that? We did have a very comprehensive view campaign that's called a Dynamo took place 2011 to 12. And this is a map showing the um, lots of different instrument and platform being used, aircraft, the ships, and so on over this area. So I was an aircraft scientist. So I um, flew through a lot of these uh, flights. These are the, the red ones are the area we'll fly through. So in the aircraft measurements, we can measure much higher uh, uh, resolution in terms of a storm itself, SST, the cold pools generated by center storms. And then we also drop the uh, ocean uh, drop. We have uh, both GPS drop sounds and ocean AXPTs measure temperature 
in the ocean, in the upper ocean, and the deeper ocean part. This is sort of a picture of that. So then you can tell that thunderstorm can generate cold pools, uh, almost degree to two degree cooling in this very high frequency time scales. But then at the same time, after month and a half measurements, we also captured a well observed angel event. So just give you an example of this kind of a measurement that can tell us a lot of things about uh, air sea interaction properties. So just to focus on the uh, left side, so we measure from the aircraft and the way I plotted, we plotted here, uh, by the way, all these results is in this BAMS paper 2016, you describe atmosphere, uh, the winds and so on, the atmosphere boundary layer, ocean, upper ocean mix layer, and so on, so on. So we can categorize it as a surprise phase, which is not a very active MGO phases, and then active MGO phases. You can see the upper ocean in the MGO surprise phase is warmer during the active rainy period of time, MGO ocean, upper ocean is cooler. And at the same time, you can see the cold pools from the convective system are much stronger in the surprise phase because it's dry. Uh, as you know, that entrainment from the uh, uh, dry air can induce a very cold, big cold pool. So if you put it all together, as you can tell that this air sea fluxes, this is the sensible heat flux, latent heat flux, from surprise phase to active phase through transition period, you can see the air sea fluxes increase tenfold. Uh, these has all different roles in play in how to getting MGO from surprise phase you, to the active phase. So without too much time, I'm here only gave you an example why this thing matters, right? In the MGO time scale, this you can tell from the synoptic weather scale, they do have a lot of details. To put them all together, I want to come back with one question that I asked before I get here, is what is ocean's role in terms of uh, making MGO propagate eastward or help? Get? So on the top row, so now we're using both observation and the models. So we can do uncoupled atmosphere simulation, coupled simulation, and the better air sea fluxes corrected by the observations. So the top row so shows you the MGO propagate eastward in terms of both precipitation winds and induce very large ocean cooling in over the entire Indian basin, right? So if you run the uncoupled model, you don't have that property. So precipitation sits still because there's too much excessive energy that it doesn't exist in reality. So rain tend to stay uh, stationary. And then if you use the one that I just showed, you can see the propagation observed and the very stationary MGO um, over Indian Ocean. So once you start coupling, you start seeing the eastward propagation, even better when we correct air sea fluxes based on those observations. So air sea coupling matters. So with the rest of the part, I'm going to tell you a little bit of current work that we're doing is that MGO propagate toward the West Pacific interacting with this phenomenon that you know very well, that's a large scale uh, inso patterns. So this uh, is a diagram probably doesn't really need much explanation except to say that this is a La Nino state, the surface temperature and the very strong uh, trade wind, easterly winds. During the normal phase MGO, uh, the uh, inso, so you can see the, the uh, precipitation and the, and, the, and the SST map. So the, the warm part of SST is closer to the uh, Central Pacific. The important thing is the thermal climb. So the uh, thermal climb is much tilted. And then by the time you go into the La Nino state, the thermal climb tilted uh, downward. So you have a much deeper warm pool and then a bigger warm pool in the Central Pacific and so on. So what does this thing has to do with MGO, right? So as it turned out, 
MGO has a very important property that project onto ENSO spatial and time scale in terms of the upscaling. So this is MGO that if you look at MGO precipitation and also the westerly winds, it's very large scale. So as the MGO propagating into the West Pacific and Central Pacific, that projecting onto the scale that ENSO, a matter to ENSO. So this happened to be some events that we observed and also uh, we modeled. Uh, quickly, so over last 20 years uh, that we find in this paper that the ENSO event over last 20 years, the onside of ENSO, this is a new three or four index. So you can see in general, right before the onside, you have enhanced energy geo event every single ENSO event. So there's definitely indication that MGO contribute to this eastward uh, warm pool extension. So to project it onto the anomaly phase, that if you look at MGO induced the warming, I'll just to say this last panel, that the warming really projected onto the, uh, the uh, Nino, uh, Nino 3 and 4. So what happens uh, the, when the MGO coming over the West Pacific, they influence the ocean, right? So the way MGO influence oceans through both dynamic process and thermodynamic process, MGO rain and produce the strong winds and generate the Kevin waves. That's well defined, uh, described in this paper that deepen the thermal climb. So repeat MGO events can really continue that process projecting into large scale. The other process is through the thermodynamic process. Again, it's observed through fuel campaign during Coca Core. Uh, this paper describes another phenomenon that is after the MGO, MGO rains and dump a lot of fresh water. So the fresh water on the upper ocean gave you this fresh water lenses and this particular lens that can generate in this pool of warm water because after uh, MGO is gone, you have enhanced the solar radiation. This warm pool can help generating this something called a barrier layer. Uh, you can go into the detail uh, in this paper to describe the uh, salinity distribution, temperature distribution. You have a very deep uh, mixed layer during the strong wind events, but then you have this very shallow uh, warm layer. And then the barrier layer is by its name is blocking the cold water through this barrier layer get to the upper ocean. So the upper ocean warm part gets protected through that process. So this particular event, then we did a modeling study over this region. So we'll find that MGO influence, uh, I don't have time to go through the model detail, I apologize, but this will be made available to you. So then we have uh, made this couple simulation over eight months we have a multiple MGO event right before this onside of ENSO. Then we'll find each MGO event contribute to the deepening of a thermal climb. And also most importantly, MGO also produces fresh water pool. You see the blue ones that MGO after MGO, it's pushed toward the central Pacific and it was a very interesting uh, fresh layer. Um, so, I don't think I have a time to go through the details. I'm just gonna summarize in this schematic to show you this multi-scale process. So this is the schematic that many of you are familiar with it published from a, based on a publication uh, some years ago. So the, uh, the, over the West Pacific, you have a warm pool and this is Central Pacific. The coupled system has zonal winds, it's a trade winds, easterly and MGO sit over here. So when the MGO produce a large freshwater pool, then generate a barrier layer, right? So then this freshwater pool become active and move eastward. Um, so that's the MGO. So by the time that the warm pool, the pool started to um, become active in the ocean, now has life on its own. So this water now is actually propagate eastward against the wind. 
this is something that is brand new. We just discovered it from the couple of model simulations. So the first was came as a surprise. But if you think about it, from the atmosphere point of view, you know the dense water here and the, the less dense fresh water is going to have this sort of frontal system that the lighter water sliding above the dense water, the subduct subduction of, the, of this. The same time, this part generate a pressure gradient. This pressure gradient in the upper ocean itself drive this very dynamic water uh, in here. This water is the result of MGO, even though after MGO precipitation is gone, this piece of water remained to be alive. And that actually communicate from the West Pacific toward Central Pacific and East Pacific. So after multiple events, you can see the deepening of the thermal climb by MGO through Kevin waves. So eventually after multiple MGO event, you can start seeing the coupled effect, right? So the, the, SS, the uh, warm water push Central Pacific, in, uh, the reduce the SSC gradient. Now that property is going to relax this trade wind. As soon as the trade wind relax, you're getting this fully coupled mode for ENSO. That's the onset of ENSO. So this, you can't miss every single one because the high frequency one that determines how good the fresh water pool is. And once the fresh water pool dump in the ocean, then ocean takes its own dynamics. And then that contribute to much larger basin scale properties. So I don't think I have a time to get to this one here. Uh, do I have a one minute to say something? This is my last slide. I run over time a little bit. Yes, go ahead. OK, so I want to touch on one thing that uh, the last yesterday, both Eric has mentioned this heating sources that MGO in the Northern Hemisphere versus MGO in the Southern Hemisphere. And the Anhal described the uh, global impact of MGO, right? So as it turned out, this is a good example of a detailed MGO event. This event versus that event have a very different downstream influence, right? So the way we did this MGO influence is that you can look at on the sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. You can look at MGO influence on tropical cyclones, atmosphere rivers, heat waves, and the floods and drought and, and so on and so on. This particular slide just show you one example. That's the tropical cyclones, right? So the way we plotted this thing is that we will look if you have MGO versus you have no MGO, then you compare how many events that are associated with MGOs, how many events uh, that tropical cyclone um, occurs without MGO. So that actually gave you a quite a good uh, indication of, of you know, MGO downstream influence. So basically this is the event of tropical cyclones associated with MGO versus MGO, uh, the uh, tropical cyclone without MGO. So pretty much the Atlantic basin, it's very interesting because almost twice as much of that tropical cyclone is associated with event in MGO. On the other hand, if we break down to MGO in the Northern hemisphere versus MGO in the Southern hemisphere, so here is this bar. You can ignore the, all the bar, just look at this last one pair. Okay, in the North Pacific, uh, North Atlantic, then you can see the ones when the MGO sitting Northern hemisphere, you get majority of MG, uh, tropical cycle event. This is a very large difference, right? So then for Atlantic is the same. So that tells me that MGO detailed MGO structure has a lot to do with the downstream influence, but you need to distinguish where the heat source is. So with that, I'm just going to summarize this, which mostly already stated. I want to make sure that uh, we all sort of gave a detailed look to think about MGO that can be a source of predictability through this multi-scale air sea interaction process that bridging both weather and climate. 
So with that, uh, I can probably take any questions if I have time. Thank so you so much. I Thank you, Shui.